Today's episode is brought to you by the Your Brain on Facts book. Want the facts without my voice? Order the Your Brain on Facts book today. If you want my voice without the facts, you can hire me for voiceover work. No project too small, and my listeners get a 50% off rate. Email me at moxie at yourbrainonfacts.com. A quick content warning, this episode does contain a homophobic slur in its original context. The history of the human being is divided into two major epochs, the dividing line between them being the first written record. If you were asked to name the greatest advance in mankind's ability to record its history and disseminate ideas, before the internet of course, you might well say that came in 1493 when Johannes Gutenberg of Germany created a printing press with movable type. Gutenberg was a little tardy to the party as it turns out. How tardy? As much as 400 years. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. What was so big about movable type? Well, movable type meant that each letter had its own little block, and they could be arranged in any format that was needed to make any text. Prior to that, the entire page of text had to be carved in one single block of wood, like an enormous stamp. Now consider the amount of time it would take to carve one such block, then multiply that by the number of pages in even the shortest book. Any printing press was an improvement over hand-lettered manuscripts, but the Gutenberg press could print over 200 pages per minute, which gave the world what would be called the Gutenberg 42-line Bible. Books and the ideas that they contained were no longer the exclusive purview of the very wealthy. Greater access to ideas and information was a causative force behind such things as the Renaissance, the Protestant Reformation, and the Industrial Revolution. But Gutenberg did not create the first movable type press. A printing press with movable metal type was developed in Korea during the Goryeo dynasty, which ran from 819 to 1392, in a desperate attempt to preserve religious texts in the face of a Mongol invasion. The effort was successful, but only just barely. A single copy of a single volume of one book remains. It's called the Jikji, which is the abbreviated title of a Korean Buddhist anthology whose title can be translated as Anthology of Great Buddhist Priests' Zen Teachings. Jikji is a little easier to say. The Jikji is a collection of excerpts from the teachings of the most revered Buddhist monks throughout successive generations, collated by a monk named Gyogan. It was published in two volumes in 1372, though the first volume has been lost completely. Further weakening the Gutenberg was first position, the Korean press wasn't even the first press that had movable type. The earliest known non-metallic movable type press was developed in China in the 10th century. That press used clay blocks, which would prove to be too fragile, though it was thought to have directly influenced the Korean design. There's also evidence that Gutenberg's press may not be an example of simultaneous invention. A record in the Swiss Museum of Paper indicates a papal delegation to Goryeo brought printing technology back to Europe. Korea's claim to origination carries some serious bona fides in the form of a 2001 addition to the Memory of the World program by UNESCO the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Three years later, the Jikji Memory of the World Prize was created, which, quote, recognizes institutions that have contributed to the preservation and accessibility of documentary heritage to safeguard against collective amnesia, neglect, the ravages of time and climate conditions, and willful and deliberate destruction. If the listener would like to see the Jikji in person, they might want to bone up on their French. Rather than reposing rightfully in Korea, 
The Jigji has been kept in La Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris. It was acquired under, let's call them unclear circumstances, by the first French consul to Korea and passed to La Bibliothèque upon his death. The consensus in Korea is, unsurprisingly, that they would like it to be returned, that cultural artifacts belong in their country of origin. La Bibliothèque adamantly refuses, arguing that the Jigji is part of humanity's common heritage and therefore doesn't belong to anyone. Which raises the question, at least in this reporter's mind, if it belongs to everyone and therefore no one, what would it matter if they gave it back? On a brighter note, a wood carving print of the Jigji is currently kept in the National Library of Korea. Sometimes a person we remember as the first to do something wasn't preempted by someone else, they merely failed to complete the thing they're credited with. Such is the case with Ferdinand Magellan, the name long attached to the first circumnavigation of the Earth. Magellan certainly intended to sail around the globe when he set sail from Spain in September 1519. Of the five ships that began the voyage, only three made it as far as the Pacific Ocean. One was turned back by mutineers. Another was abandoned as it sailed through what is now known as the Strait of Magellan. It had taken a month to reach the Pacific Ocean, and the crew of that ship had given up any hope of a good outcome. The three remaining ships floated in the Pacific Ocean for nearly three months, unable to resupply until they landed in Guam. The crew was near starvation, but with so much distance behind them, it looked like they were going to succeed in reaching the Spice Islands, so they pressed on. In the end, only one of the five ships would return to Spain, with a scant 18 of the original 260 crewmen. Magellan himself was among the dead, having been killed when the Spanish were defeated by natives in the Battle of Mactan in the Philippines in April of 1521. There are two schools of thought as to who should be credited with the first circumnavigation in Magellan's absence. One side argues that that distinction should go to Magellan's personal slave, Enrique of Malacca. Magellan had seized Enrique during a siege of the 1511 voyage to the East Indies, and the Malay man later served as the expedition's interpreter in the Pacific Islands. Shortly after Magellan's death, Enrique abandoned the expedition and disappeared. Rightly so. By then, he was only a few hundred miles short of his origin in Malacca. If he continued on to his homeland, as many speculate he did, Enrique would have earned the credit of being the first person to circumnavigate the globe, completing not Magellan's journey, but his own. Some historians argue that Magellan's mission was completed by the handful of sailors who made it back to Spain under the command of Juan Sebastian Elcano. Elcano became captain of the ship Victoria after Magellan and two subsequent captains died, guiding her to the port of San Lucar some three years after they had set out. Elcano was awarded an annual pension and a coat of arms by Charles I of Spain, featuring a globe with the motto Primus Circumdetisti Me. In Latin, you went around me first, which sounds rather more like a Boy Scout badge than a prestigious honor, but hey, it's nice to be recognized. Another name inexorably connected to pioneering accomplishments in long-distance travel is Charles Lindbergh, Lucky Lindy was a media sensation in 1927, when at the age of 25, he made a non-stop flight from Long Island, New York, to Paris, France. He covered about 3,600 statute miles, or 5,800 kilometers, alone in the single-engine Spirit of St. Louis, in what was lauded to be the first non-stop flight between North America and Europe. While he retains credit for managing the flight alone, to have been the first to fly across the ocean, Lindbergh would have to have pulled those 33.5 hours any time before 1919. That was the year John Alcock and Arthur Brown 
flew a modified World War I bomber from Newfoundland, Canada to Connemara, Ireland. They also carried a small amount of mail on the flight, making it simultaneously the first transatlantic airmail flight. Englishman John Alcock had been fascinated by aviation as a teenager and was a military pilot during World War I. Taken prisoner in Turkey after the engines of his Handley Page bomber failed over the Gulf of Zeros. Scottish born to American parents and raised in England, Arthur Brown was an engineer before the war. He also spent time as a POW after being shot down in Germany. In April of 1913, the Daily Mail newspaper offered a prize of £10,000, about $340,000 today, to the aviator who shall first cross the Atlantic in an aeroplane in flight from any point in the United States of America, Canada or Newfoundland, and any point in Great Britain or Ireland in 72 continuous hours. Understandably, the contest was suspended with the outbreak of war in 1914, but reopened after the armistice was declared in 1918. During his imprisonment, Alcock fixated on the idea of flying across the Atlantic one day. After the war, he approached the Vickers Engineering and Aviation Firm, who were converting a bomber for the long flight, replacing the bomb racks with extra petrol tanks. Where Alcock's enthusiasm impressed them so much, he was appointed as their pilot. When an unemployed Brown approached Vickers looking for a position, his knowledge of long-distance navigation convinced them to take him on as Alcock's navigator. Taking off on July 14, 1919, the two pilots found themselves in for a flight that was difficult and treacherous, to put things mildly. The overloaded aircraft had difficulty taking off and only barely missed the tops of trees. The wind-driven electrical generator failed, depriving them of radio contact, their intercom, and their heat. An exhaust pipe burst shortly after that, causing a frightening amount of noise which made conversation impossible. I had a 1980 Volvo in the late 90s that had a crack in the exhaust line and we couldn't even talk over that. They had to fly through thick fog, which should only be undertaken with gyroscopic instruments, which they did not have. Alcock twice lost control of the aircraft and nearly hit the sea after a spiral dive. Their electric heating suits had also failed, making them very cold in the, oh did I mention it, open cockpit. But their coffee was laced with whiskey, because at that point, why not? Brown had to climb out onto the wings and knock accumulated ice from the carburetors, while Alcock flew dangerously low in the hopes of preventing the engines from freezing over again. Sixteen hours later, the two of them landed in Ireland. The situation did not improve at that point, as locals tried to wave them to a landing strip, but they crashed into a bog. This was not the result of error or ineptitude. Brown had removed the front wheel to reduce weight, and they couldn't risk landing on a solid runway. A week after the historic flight, the aviators were awarded the honor of Knight Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire by King George V. Now that is a title. Uh, this reporter's husband would like the listener to know that the first transatlantic flight was in reality accomplished by an albatross, which has earned him an annoyed stare and the threat of divorce. Scientists and inventors create something from absolutely nothing. That's why they're so cool. But they also build on the work of others. Sometimes this means improving or repurposing an existing technology. Sometimes it's a little closer to taking someone else's work and just slapping your name on it. When it comes to the telephone, the latter proved to be true for Italian immigrant Antonio Miucci. Miucci studied the principles of electromagnetic voice transmission for many years. In 1856, he installed a crude telephone-like device in his house to connect his basement workshop to the second floor where his wife was ill at the time. In 1871, he filed a patent caveat, 
a sort of legally binding dibs that existed at the time to signify a person's intention to file a full patent, describing what he called his sound telegraph. Unfortunately for Miyuchi, the caveat was not properly written, and it left out key information. It detailed the need to insulate the parts, and even the user, without explaining that the sound is being converted to variable electrical conduction in the wire. Other sections were so vague that it was unclear that he had created anything new at all. It was omissions such as these that allowed Alexander Graham Bell to file his patent for the telephone in 1876. It was thought that Miyuchi's difficult personal finances had prevented him from paying the fee for the full patent application. But he applied for and was granted four patents in the 1870s, so we may never know the real reason. Miyuchi had tried to move forward with the sound telegraph presenting the plans and caveat to American District Telephone Company of New York, asking their permission to test his apparatus on the company's telegraph lines. Two years would pass without response from the company. When Meucci asked for his documents back, they had lost them. In 1887, the Bell Telephone Company filed suit against various telephone companies and Meucci for patent infringement in court battles that dragged on for years. The evidence Bell produced to substantiate his claims was disregarded by the court. But sadly, Miyuchi did not live to see this vindication, having died in 1889. Bell's name is often said in the same breath as 19th century America's inventor emeritus Thomas Edison credited with giving the world the incandescent light bulb. As mentioned before, few inventions are the work of any one person, and in truth, Edison had an entire laboratory of men testing potential filament materials and bulb constructions. Edison's team did make significant improvements to the light bulb, not only in the filament, but with a higher vacuum than other makers had been able to achieve and a high resistance that made power distribution from a centralized source economically viable. There were numerous ancestors to the light bulb before Edison's 1880 patent, some of which had patents of their own. As early as 1802, Sir Humphrey Davy, the ether-sniffing scientist and bon vivant you heard about in Physician Test Thyself, who's also written about in the Your Brain on Facts book, demonstrated incandescence with a strip of platinum. As a filament, it didn't glow bright enough or last long enough, but the precedent had been set. In 1838, Belgian lithographer Marcelin Jobard invented an incandescent light bulb with a vacuum atmosphere using a carbon filament. Five years later, British scientist Warren de la Rue enclosed a coiled platinum filament in a vacuum tube. The concept was that the high melting point of platinum would allow it to operate at high temperatures and that the evacuated chamber would contain fewer gas molecules to react to the platinum, improving its longevity. Although it worked, the cost of the platinum made it impractical for commercial use. In 1841, Frederick de Molaines of England was granted the first patent for an incandescent lamp with a design using platinum wires contained within a vacuum bulb. Another of Moline's designs used carbon. In 1845, American John W. Starr acquired a patent for his incandescent light bulb involving the use of carbon filaments. However, he died shortly after obtaining the patent and his invention was never produced commercially. Some of Edison's R&D came in the form of just buying the patent rights from other inventors, such as Canadians Henry Woodward and Matthew Evans, whose lamp consisted of carbon rods mounted in a nitrogen-filled glass cylinder. When you get scientists working together, you get things like the telephone and the light bulb. What happens if you pair an ER doctor eating out of vending machines and an award-winning chef? You get Smart for Life. Smart for Life is a full range of snacks, supplements, bars, shakes, and soups, good for either 
concerted weight loss, or for just trying to replace your unhealthy grab-and-go snacks with something, I don't know, maybe even a little bit good for you? Created by a doctor who discovered his busy shifts were causing him to eat more and more poorly, each recipe is designed by an award-winning chef, and shockingly, y'all, they're good. I especially like the lemon bar and the s'mores bar. And you can get 10% off your next purchase from smartforlife.com using the coupon code MOXIE10, M-O-X-I-E-1-0, at smartforlife.com. Another name that has been given the credit for a group effort and unwarranted firstie status was Alan Turing. Turing is credited with cracking the Enigma Code, the up till then utterly unbreakable German code system. This required the creation of the massive BOMB machine, that's B-O-M-B-E, a six by seven foot aggregation of gears, rotors, and 12 miles worth of wires capable of working to the equivalent of 36 Enigma machines. As the bomb worked its way through every permutation of rotor settings, electrical current would either flow or not flow through the system, which was checked by the bomb's comparator unit. Using this method, it was possible to check for a logical contradiction, ruling out particular rotor settings. If there was no contradiction, the machine would stop and the rotor setting could be noted down. These could then be tested by hand on a Type-X machine modified to work like the Enigma. Meanwhile, the bomb could be started again, looking for the next possible solution until the code had been broken. It's been estimated that this single machine shortened the war by at least two years. Turing and his team expanded upon the earlier work of Polish mathematicians. British intelligence focused on employing linguists to try to decipher the German codes. The Polish, on the other hand, realized that they needed mathematicians capable of working out the patterns. Thus, they put together a team of their best. And if my gentle listener has any of these last names, I'm sorry in advance. The team was comprised of Henryk Zygalski, Jerzy Rozicki, and Marian Rejewski. Working together, the three developed electromechanical computers they nicknamed Bombas, meaning bomb, owing to the ticking sound that they made while in operation, which simulated the guts of an Enigma machine. Turing would eventually meet with the Polish team when British code-breaking attempts hit a wall, and his now famous bomb was essentially a scaled-up version of the Polish Bombas, right down to the name. In 1932, Poland assembled the Polish Cipher Bureau in response to what they perceived to be the rising German threat. Among the cryptographers hired, they recruited three young mathematicians, whose names I'm not going to repeat, I'm sorry. To help them in their work, the French military intelligence provided the Polish Bureau with two German documents and two pages of Enigma daily keys that they had acquired. The items had been stolen by a French spy who worked in Germany's cipher office in Berlin. With these clues, Rajewski was able to crack the code using the mathematical theory of permutations and groups. Along with a few lucky guesses, such that the non-commercial version of the Enigma typewriter featured keys in alphabetical order. Subsequently, the Polish cryptographers were able to construct Enigma doubles to help them transcribe coded messages. In all, they devised three different methods for breaking the encrypted codes produced on the Enigma machine. However, just prior to the onset of the war, the Germans added two rotors to the system, increasing the possible wheel orders from six to 60. The Poles were still able to read a small number of messages but they clearly needed to solve the new rotors. Time, however, was not on their side. Once the German invasion of Poland became imminent in 1939, the Polish government handed over all of their research, including an Enigma machine, to the British in hopes that the British could continue their work, which they most certainly did 
resulting in the full cracking of the Enigma Code during the early stages of World War II, and for which Britain has claimed virtually all the credit. Bonus fact, a leap forward in deciphering Enigma codes came from a rather pedestrian place, a weather report. The Nazis issued a weather report every morning encrypted by the Enigma code, a broadcast that was done in the same format daily. The British realized that the last phrase on the weather report was probably Heil Hitler. That allowed them to crack and reveal the Enigma settings used for that day. Eventually, the Germans cottoned on and switched to a variety of different Enigma machines, such as a four or five rotor machine, as well as double encrypting messages. But the British codebreakers caught up to them too. The British themselves took the concept of the Enigma cipher and improved it in such a way that the Germans thought it was impossible to crack as it was even more sophisticated than the Enigma itself. After Enigma, the second thing people know about Alan Turing is that he was homosexual. As is NBA center Jason Collins, the first professional basketball player to come out as gay in 2013. In 2015, David Denson followed suit and became what the press called the first openly gay active player on a team affiliated with Major League Baseball. The problem with that title is that LA Dodgers outfielder Glenn Burke beat them both to the punch by nearly four decades. Talent scouts thought Burke had the potential to be the Willie Mays of his generation. While coaches were impressed by his talent, they were not impressed by his openness about his sexual orientation. Burke did not suppress his identity, but sports writers refused to make any mention of it. They couldn't put that in an article. Coach Tommy Lasorda, known to my generation as the guy from the Slim Fast commercials and literally nothing else, and Team VP Al Campanis had the temerity to offer Burke $75,000, about $300,000 today, to marry a woman. In an irony that would seem farcical if it wasn't so tragic, Lasorda's son Tom Jr. died of AIDS-related disease in 1991. To this day, Tommy Lasorda Sr. refuses to acknowledge his son's homosexuality. After only two years with the Dodgers, Burke was traded to the Oakland A's, where manager Billy Martin introduced him to his new teammates by saying, this is Glenn Burke and he's a faggot. A little more than a year later, Burke left baseball behind entirely. Mentioning that Burke came before Collins and Denson is not intended in any way to detract from the risks that any of these men took in coming out. Professional sports is a temple for the, quote, male ideal. Management, fellow players, and fans alike have a well-documented history of hostility toward those they even suspect of being gay. Conditions have improved somewhat, but we still have a long way to go. While Burke is often denied recognition for being the first openly gay professional athlete, he is credited with popularizing the high five, which, at the risk of editorializing, is kind of burying the lead, if ever there was one. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. Each generation of textbooks, written from other textbooks, solidifies a single version of events we knew to be true. Luckily, the wonders of the information age have helped us discover the real story. It can be hard to supplant the version of history that we grew up with, but if we're able to handle Leif Erikson beating Christopher Columbus to the New World by 500 years, we can learn these other things too. Thanks for spending part of your day with me. And stay safe.